Okay. Representative Cartwright, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my pleasure, Marnie. I'd like to begin with uh, the impeachment trial in the Senate. And some Republicans are questioning uh, today its constitutionality. In fact, Senator Rand Paul called the trial a partisan exercise designed to further divide the country, saying impeachment is for removal from office. And this effort is the antithesis of unity. How do you respond to that? Well, first off, I, it, I, I'm loath to comment on the processes of the Senate. To me, it's a, a dark and mysterious place. Um, but as far as uh, Rand Paul's comments, I don't agree with it, and I'll tell you why. Um, I think there has to be accountability. Uh, this is the reason that I voted to send it over to the Senate for witnesses and a trial, uh, because we had this attack on our nation's capital, the citadel of American democracy was under attack. The capital has not been breached, had not been breached since the War of 1812. Uh, and this was something that, um, you know, could have gone very ugly. I mean, it was really uh, uh, by the grace of God that elected officials, including Mike Pence, uh, were not injured uh, and or killed. Uh, so it, it's not something to take lightly. Uh, we know that the mob was incited by the president, uh, and there has to be accountability. So the Senate can do what it wants, but I feel quite good about sending that over uh, for the full hearing uh, on the impeachment. Uh, as far as unconstitutionality, I, I don't know about that, because there are consequences. Other, other elected officials have been impeached in the Senate after leaving office. So this is not unprecedented. Isn't the argument also, though, that the motivation by those pushing to impeach, certainly in the Senate, is to prevent the president from running again in 2024? That is one of the possible consequences, but it's up to the Senate not only to, to decide guilt on the charges, uh, but also to decide what the, uh, what the penalty will be. What do you say to those who are concerned with that possibility that elected leaders shouldn't have the power to prevent people uh, from running for office and ultimately leaving it up to the people to decide uh, who to vote for? Well, again, uh, to me, that would be a bit of an abdication, uh, Marnie, because, uh, you know, if we assume the truth of everything that's in that uh, that indictment in, in that impeachment, that's what an impeachment is, an indictment that sends it out, sends it over for a trial. We assume the truth of all of those things. It's horrible. I mean, it's an incitement to, uh, uh, to attack the Capitol, uh, to send a bunch of insurgents to, uh, with violent intent over to the Capitol. Um, it, I, I, I can't really imagine just uh, letting it go and we'll say, well, we'll leave it up to the voters to see what they all think about it. I don't think that's the right approach. Congressman Cartwright, we have heard continued calls for unity and for both sides of the aisle to work together moving forward. It was certainly a welcome message on Inauguration Day. Uh, does the squad on the Democratic side in the House and the Freedom Force now on the Republican side in the House make that job more challenging or does it leave a path uh, for compromise? No, I think it marginalizes the extremes. It really does, Marnie. Uh, particularly, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the inauguration speech made it very clear that Joe Biden intends to be the president for everybody, including the people that did not vote for him. That's always been my approach, too. Uh, I got elected to represent everybody in northeastern Pennsylvania's 8th congressional district, and, and I'm very dead serious about doing it. Uh, Biden's been the same way for 47 years in elected federal office. Uh, he's got himself in trouble with Democrats for agreeing, agreeing too readily with Republicans over the years. Republicans know that. Republicans remember that. And I think that gives him kind of a wellspring of a reserve of goodwill uh, among Republicans in the Senate. Uh, let's hope that, that it does. Let's hope that they recognize his goodwill uh, and return it, uh, because that is what this country needs now more than ever the very unity that Joe Biden talked about in his inauguration speech. And when you talk about extremes in the chambers, where do you see opportunities to deliver on your promise to your constituents and to continue that message of unity uh, nationwide to get the work done? 
Well, look, it, it's like charity be begins at home and, and uh, bipartisanship begins with each person. And I have, I have worked very hard over the years to be bipartisan. Uh, to, I, I've actually introduced more bipartisan bills than any other Democrat in the House during my time there. I think you can hear my bipartisan <laughs> dog barking right now. I, I can't tell if he agrees with you or not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, look, uh, I'm close friends with a lot of Republicans in the House. Uh, and and, uh, and I, re I regard that as part of my job. I know Biden has always felt the same way. Uh, and, you know, uh, who is it? Chris Matthews always talks about the good old days, you know, when Tip O'Neill and Ron Reagan would go at it hammer and tong, and then they'd go out for a drink afterward. I, I, I like that idea. I like that whole construct that, that we... We zealous, zealously uh, advocate for our viewpoint, but we but we leave uh, personal animus uh, behind, and we work together as much as ever we can because it is the American people that need us to do that now more than ever to beat this COVID virus. We need to come together. We need to fund the efforts to kill it, um, and and get us back on a path where we can rebuild our economy, build those jobs, better paying jobs. Uh, and, and I have a lot of optimism for the future, you know, with two more drug companies coming online with the vaccine, with Joe Biden responding to the calls for more aggressive, uh, more ambitious plans for immunizing people. He's up to 1.5 million a day. 1.5 million people a day is the new goal. And he responded by upping his goal uh, to some calls that we could do it. Um, and that means... Think of it, um, it uh, the, by the end of the summer, we're talking two thirds of the American public will, will have been vaccinated. That'll send our economy straight up. It's gonna be like the roaring 20s again after, they, after this country recovered from the, the last pandemic a century ago. Well, let's hope so, hope so, Congressman. I do want to spend just one more moment on the pandemic uh, before I ask you one more question. Uh, in your state, what is the status of the pandemic and cases? And also, what advice are you giving to your constituents when it comes to their concerns over the virus, uh, the distribution challenges that we're seeing, and uh, the long lines that we also are witnessing in terms of getting the shots into people's arms? Okay, uh, that's a mouthful there. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, as far as the numbers, uh, uh, we've seen them tapering off a little bit. I mean, it was bad there. A couple of weeks ago, it was like you know, a 9-11 every day in this country uh, from the number of people dying. I spent this morning uh, helping immunize um, Scranton, uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania policemen and firemen. Uh, you know, frontline workers, uh, people who are exposed to people that, that may have the virus. And um, I think that um, a, a big part of this is pushing back against the, the folks that are unsure or don't trust the vaccine. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a significant number of people that get, get their, their information, their news online and from uh, uncredited sources. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of anti-vaxxers out there that, that need to be persuaded that this is safe, it's not gonna hurt you, and you need to, you need to take it. Because that, uh, that is one of, the, that's one of the reasons most of the members of Congress got vaccinated, to show everybody we're putting our, you know, our shoulders where our mouth is, that we're gonna take that vaccine because we know it's safe and we wanna show everybody that's the way we feel about it. Finally, President Biden wants to raise the minimum wage, as you know, to $15 an hour. Many Republicans saying doing that now, certainly during a pandemic, uh, furthers the burden on businesses that have been struggling over the last few months. Uh, is this the right time for that debate? Um, it's always the right time uh, to debate about paying people fairly. Uh, if you had listened to Republicans in the 1940s, they would have said it's outrageous that we're paying people $2 an hour. Uh, and if we had, you know, oh, now is not the time. We can't do it now. Um, it, it, we would never have raised the minimum wage if we had listened to those arguments. Now, keep in mind, uh, uh, President Biden's plan is to do it gradually. It's uh, $15 by 2025. Uh, it's not right away. And um, 
I, look, I, I, I think that uh, our American economy uh, is a cornucopia of wealth. It is not a zero sum game. It's something that we can all work on together. We can build it together uh, and there's gonna be plenty for everybody. Representative Matt Cartwright from Pennsylvania, thank you so much for your time tonight. Nice to be with you.